The final speaker today is uh, Dr. Helen Snee uh, from University of Manchester, um, also representative of the other NCRM network um, that has been set up as part of the same uh, call on, on digital methods, and hopefully you'll say something about that as well. Um, but you're going to talk about uh, evaluate, um, uh, analyzing, analyzing uh, blogs. Um, so I'd just like to thank uh, the opportunity to come to speak to you today. Um, today I'm just going to uh, present some um, my experiences really of uh, qualitative blog analysis. Um, and in some ways this is kind of a, a how not to do qualitative blog analysis. And I kind of want to present some of my experiences as coming to researching social media for the first time um, as uh, part of the project I did for my PhD thesis and talk a little bit about some of the general uh, opportunities and challenges that my experiences raise, um, I think. So what I'm going to do today is uh, just to kind of uh, give you an indication of the sorts of research that can be conducted using um, qualitative blog analysis, talk a bit my, about my case study, and then reflect and perhaps think about the, the future directions. Okay. So just think about what do we mean by qualitative blog analysis. Um, well, the... <coughs> Excuse me. A very uh, unhelpful definition, but it's the best one I can come up with, is that we apply qualitative analysis principles to the studies of blogs. And that doesn't really tell us very much, I don't think, about the sorts of things that we can do with um, qualitative blog analysis. So uh, a more useful approach then is to think about how, how qualitative researchers use blogs in social science research. So I've just highlighted three examples here, which I think really... Um, Kind of demonstrate some of the, the potentials of the methods. So first of all, um, we could think about using blogs as um, a data collection tool. I'll just stop you. No? Okay. Um, that's better. So uh, yes, using blogs as a data collection tool. So um, more and Ellison Venn in um, a study of. Uh, household um, sleep patterns really and interactions and the embeddedness of sleep um, in the household. So it's a family study and they looked at, um, they asked uh, children and teenagers to keep diaries of their uh, sleep and they found that um, asking them to keep blogs was a really effective method of kind of capturing this. It's a very popular way of them to keep sleep diaries. Um, but this was actually a private blog so it was only accessible to the participants and the researchers. Um, alternatively, uh, social scientists have been interested in exploring the phenomenon of blogging itself and kind of how this uh, relates to online cultures. So Paul Hodkinson's done some, quite a lot of work on um, goths and goth cultures. And uh, he used um, an ethnographic study of live journal goth bloggers. And live journal is kind of like a, a mix, little bit of a mix between a social network and a blog. Um, and he was looking at the transition of the goth community's online um, discussions from kind of forums to these more interactive um, kind of social networks and blogs in the context of um, ideas about kind of wider social trends of individualization. So in order to do this, he actually conducted participant observation. He set up his own blog and he kind of interacted with those networks. So that's really exploring the phenomenon of these online discussions themselves. <coughs> And the third kind of approach, which is closer to the kind of thing that I was trying to do with my blog analysis, is to look at traces um, of offline life found in blogs, or perhaps ways of capturing aspects of life more generally in uh, different ways. So Hookway um, has written a, a very, very useful kind of methodological piece on uh, blog analysis. Um, and his study was based on exploring narratives of morality in everyday life. And he argues it's quite hard to access people's ideas about what's right and wrong and what they actually do in terms of um, moral decision making. So using kind of these spontaneous narratives of blogs is a really good way of doing that. So um, he collected data kind of 
doing some passive trawling of blogs, so searching for blogs, and also um, actively soliciting this through, uh, uh, through kind of contacting people in the blog community. So these are some of the various approaches to, to blog analysis. What I did um, in my study was uh, close to kind of Hookway's model. Um, so my uh, research interests were in uh, young people taking gap years. So I was looking at UK students who were taking time out between um, univers sorry, school and university, and they spent some of that uh, time travelling overseas and volunteering overseas as well. So um, my interest here was really their representations of their gap year experiences and using the blogs as um, a way of accessing their story, their account, their narrative of what this experience meant, what they did. And my particular kind of sociological interest in this was looking at how the stories were framed. So things to do with hierarchies of taste, um, the inequalities of access to gap years, their power relationships with host communities, what they thought about other people that they encountered on their travels, and to see how they told their stories and how they wanted to represent their stories to the world. So we can think of them as kind of a uh, of kind of an online version of a travel journal, but there's something a little bit different going on because it's this kind of public presentation. So just to give you an idea of the kind of data, I've, I've tried to anonymize this a little bit. Um, so this is uh, one of the posts from one of my participants in the study. So you can see it's a very, very simple blog of um, a little bit of profile information um, and then this is the first post where she talks about being excited that she's got accepted onto her placement. So I started doing the research in, started collecting the data in about 2006, 2007. So um, it's kind of, uh, this is on Blogspot. I was using blogs from Blogspot, Blogger, uh, Live Journal, some uh, MySpace blogs as well. So you can tell how old the project is because I was using MySpace blogs as well. Okay. So. The question um, we need to ask then is what was the opportunities of using um, blogs in this study? I should probably point out that um, this wasn't solely based on the blog data. I did actually conduct interviews with some of the bloggers as well, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But why did I kind of focus on this blog analysis? Well, first of all, we get these uh, obvious practical advantages in terms of access, um, which are kind of well rehearsed in the benefits of internet studies. But also the interactive um, nature of blogs means I actually had access to the, to, the, to the people who were writing them as well. So I was able to contact everybody who had written a blog and invite them um, to come and talk. To, well, I came, I went and talked to them to, uh, to, if they want to take part in an interview to contribute to the project more. So I did interview about a quarter of the bloggers um, as well. Um, so we get access not only to the blogs, but also to the authors. We also get a, a very rich um, data, there's a wealth of data. I kind of um, fell into blog analysis almost accidentally by stumbling across all of these um, blogs as I was starting to do some of the uh, groundwork for my, for my PhD. And I realized that this is wealth of kind of untapped narrative of experience that made me kind of switch my approach and, and focus on these accounts. Um, but perhaps more kind of, um, the more kind of methodological benefits, though, are that uh, conducting the blog analysis in this way, where I kind of search for blogs and uh, analyze their accounts, is very unobtrusive. And the benefits of this, then, is that these are very kind of um, naturalistic narratives that are using young people's own language and reflections um, to talk about experiences. So they're spontaneous narratives, and they're not ones that have been generated by my interaction with them. So it's what was important for young people themselves to talk about when they talked about gap years. And this really helped me to um, think about how they framed their accounts for audiences, how they told their stories, um, which is very different. It's a very different kind of um, way of generating data to asking somebody to reflect on their experience. So there's some clear kind of methodological advantages there. And also... Um, it also enables the, the um, combination of kind of comparing the narratives in the blogs with the interviews themselves. So I could compare this kind of public presentation of the, the gap year experience in the blogs with some of the more candid stories, perhaps the most reflexive stories uh, that came out of the interview accounts. Okay. 
on the flip side of this, as a kind of um, novice researcher in internet research who kind of, as I kind of said before, kind of fell into this, um, kind of uh, didn't have an awful lot of experience in internet research, some of the kind of really, um, probably some of the classic difficulties I found um, in approaching the, the data really kind of fell into two, two major kind of um, uh, categories really. Firstly were the methodological ones. So we've talked about a little bit about this already uh, today, but thinking about issues of um, sampling and representation. So, um, I mean, well, there were practical problems with the sampling as well, because I literally like, tapped Gapier into blog search engines and then trawled through all of the results myself and picked out the, the, um, the blogs that weren't kind of spam or they, were, they kind of fulfilled the criteria that I were inter was interested in. And this obviously raises huge issues in terms of who we're capturing through this type of analysis, um, who is excluded. Um, obviously, as well, there's this issue of um, blog analysis will, on will only um, allow you to uh, analyze the narratives, the experiences of bloggers. So gap young people who take gap years who don't blog about it, their kind of voices aren't going to be heard in this sort of study. Um, the second point, uh, methodological point, is again a kind of practical one in actually dealing with this type of text. Um, so as somebody who was kind of trained to do uh, you know, qualitative analysis of interview or focus group data or field note data in a particular way, where it's based very, uh, in terms of text and language, I've presented with a, a different form of text that you know, contains pictures, videos, comments, links, or audio clips, even some of the blogs had adverts on them. Um, as well, and uh, that was something that I basically didn't know how to get to grips with, so I ignored the problem, and um, I focused on the text itself, because that's kind of how I knew uh, to conduct the analysis, but obviously there's a huge uh, wealth of the, those um, other kind of me multimedia elements of the blogs that are just complete, were completely missing from my analysis. Um, and then the final methodological point then is these kind of like quite classic issues of authenticity and identity. Um, so one thing is I couldn't make any uh, conclusions about um, the blogger's class background, for example, which was something that was in terms of the type of sociological theories that I was using in terms of thinking about representation of advantage, structural inequalities. That's quite a significant uh, issue in some respects. Um, Obviously, there's the ideas of identity play, that people might be making up the fact that they were taking a gap year, although I think that was probably quite unlikely. I don't know why anybody would do that. Um, but you never know. Um, but I kind of, um, reflecting on these issues, and I think what's quite important is it depends what you're trying to do with uh, this type of analysis. So, as I said at the beginning, my research wasn't really interested in the truth of what young people do on their gap years. I was interested in the stories that were told about gap years. So it's going back to this idea of you know, using the right tools for the job. Blogs give you a very, very um, rich account of uh, these public presentations of experience. So those are kind of the methodological challenges. Um, the ethical challenges are ones that I continue to grapple with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when I think about you know, writing up my research. Um, Mike obviously flagged these earlier on and I'm sure we'll be talking about these later on this afternoon as well, but the kind of two tensions that I found in my research were considering the data as public or private. I mean, they were all uh, open access blogs, but talking to uh, the, during the interviews, talking to the bloggers, they really felt, um, they set these blogs up really for um, friends and family to kind of keep track of their progress as they went through the gap year. Although they were uh, kind of aware that randoms, that, as they called them, could access these accounts. So we get this public-private tension. Um, so that's something that I had kind of had to bear in mind as I was kind of navigating through the uh, ethical decision-making process. Um, but uh, this links to kind of the related issue of whether um, I was interested in human subjects or authors. So do um, I kind of acknowledge the authorship of the bloggers? So when I'm representing my results, do I you know, cite, the, cite links to them, give credit for their work? Or do I uh, 
protect their um, identities as human subjects. <clears throat> and the way that I kind of navigated my uh, navigated these tensions was to not see really these as kind of black and white either or distinctions, but seeing as kind of continuums where you need to pay attention to context. Um, so what I did when I've been um, writing up the research is I have anonymized the data so that the, the bloggers' real names and kind of the links aren't reproduced. Um, but um, I re uh, reproduced the uh, quotations from the blogs verbatim, and uh, probably the stickiest point really is that I didn't actually get informed consent from the bloggers themselves um, to, to use this data because it, it was kind of open access. The, the ones that I interviewed, I did get informed consent to use the blogs and obviously for the interviews themselves. So it was kind of a very tricky navigation and I still kind of asked myself whether I made the, made the right decisions there and that's something that we can probably return to later on this afternoon. Okay. Um, so as I said at the start, um, I do wonder whether kind of me presenting this today is really kind of how not to conduct blog analysis by kind of falling into it um, and kind of muddling your way through it and, and seeing what happens. Um, so the sampling strategy was obviously kind of um, n uh, very difficult actually. It took a long time to kind of trawl through um, all of the blogs. So um, using blog search engines, blogging websites, manual checking, it's a very laborious process and it took a lot longer than I thought it would. I mean, obviously, with qualitative analysis, we're not looking for any issues of kind of representativeness, but there was a huge amount of kind of irrelevant stuff that was coming out of the blog searches that I was doing. Um, secondly, um, I don't really think that I dealt with the text itself very well, and, and I think that um, in previous points about the multimedia elements um, was something that I didn't think quite know how to do. Obviously, this is, these are dynamic text, so the, the um, change on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, posts get added, posts get deleted, things get made private, um, new comments appear all the time. And obviously, for pragmatic reasons, I had to just choose a cut-off point and say, right, that, this is a date that I'm going to sample these blogs, and that's kind of it. Um, and also, the interactive elements as well. I did um, collect all of the comments that were made. Um, on the blogs, but I really did really kind of focus on the young people's stories as well. Um, and then finally, as I kind of highlighted there, I do, um, I do ask myself whether I did the right thing um, with regards to the ethics as well. So uh, thinking about very briefly then about future directions and where, how we can maybe draw on some of the lessons that I've learned in the course of doing blog analysis and where we might go in the future is... Um, issues such as developing sampling strategies or even sampling tools. So rather than me kind of uh, doing these manual blog searches and trawling through whether um, we might find uh, better tools to do that and, and also kind of related issues of better data to collection strategies. Um, but then I do wonder as thinking uh, from very much from a qualitative research perspective about looking for perhaps automated programs that might do this and whether um, we might kind of lose some of the ethnographic context and the uh, production of narratives in, in, in the blogs themselves and kind of the online context and whether we might lose that a little bit um, if we do use automated strategies. Uh, but what I think would be very particularly useful is to kind of take um, advantages and developments of analysis tools that might be able to deal with more of the multimedia elements so the, I mean, the, the analysis package that I used when I was doing this was a really antiquated version of Atlas that was purely, purely textual. And I know that more recent developments to other two software packages can actually take more um, account of some of these multimedia, dynamic, visual elements. I think the second point um, that we might be of use for blog researchers to think about is changes to the blogosphere itself. You know, we can, I won't go into the history of kind of blogs and blogging, but there have been changes over time in what a blog means, um, who blogs. Um, so the fact that bloggers themselves now are increasingly becoming a very strong kind of um, presence online in terms of uh, a very strong voice online as well. Um, and then finally, whether we can uh, ever reach some kind of consensus on the ethics of blog analysis and whether there's any kind of principles that we should be applying 
and whether um, this is actually desirable and whether we should maybe just continue to focus on negotiating tensions and trying to resolve issues in context. And um, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Um, you said that for the bloggers you interviewed, you asked uh, permission to mm -hmm. look at, at their blogs and then you, you also interviewed them. Um, did you also then share the findings from your dissertation with all the blogs that you looked at to find out how they felt you'd represented them? Because not sort of preempting mm -hmm. um, you know, the later sessions, but I think one of the things that is often quite interesting is that the thing that people care about in terms of ethics mm -hmm. is much more how they are represented. Mm -hmm. Not so much issues around privacy per se, but mm -hmm. much more did you represent me appropriately mm -hmm. in the way that I would like to be seen. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you get any of that? Um, I got, uh, the, there's kind of, one of the interesting things about this was that although blogs are interactive, I had very little interaction with the bloggers themselves. So three quarters of the sample either weren't interested in talking to me at all or didn't, even you know, kind of showed some interest and then drifted off. Um, out of the, I think it's uh, nine or ten bloggers that I actually interviewed, one of them was interested in the findings and I sent her, not the full thesis because who wants to read that, um, but you know kind of some summaries that I'd done and she was interested and she thought that was kind of, we kind of kept up a little bit, a little bit of a dialogue going. Um, so yeah I found that kind of, I think that that's one of the um, Perhaps another lesson learned is that another point that I missed was using the potential of social media and more interactive media to actually feedback feed back some of the results. But for the vast majority of, of uh, bloggers, they didn't even I contacted them. They knew that I was looking at their blogs, but that was kind of it. They didn't want to. They didn't kind of contact me further, so they probably don't really know, which does raise a whole lot of ethical uh, concerns. Thank you very much for the presentation. One of the things I liked was this sort of uncertainty that was kind of embedded in your presentation about theory and practice. And I would just like to ask if you think, in general terms, going beyond your work, mm -hmm. um, there needs to be more rigorous theoretical research connected to, connected to the methodologies that are going to be used when we're researching social media. There needs to be more... What that more rigorous, more <coughs> rigorous theoretical. Uh, research, mm -hmm. which then is going to be connected to you know the various methodologies and strategies we use when we talk about social media. Um, I think uh, I think that's a very good point, and I think it's something that it's it's something that I actually kind of did re retrospectively. Sounds like I didn't know what I would, completely didn't know what I was doing, but I had to think very carefully about the sorts of questions that the sorts of theoretical questions I could engage with using the data that I, co I collected and generated. Um, so I think that kind of thinking through those questions in advance and when in, at the point of research design would actually um, help to mitigate some of this, uh, some of this uncertainty and this, um, a lot of the tensions that I kind of encountered. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. 